Welcome to the Talent Grow Show, where you can get actionable, results-oriented insight and advice on how to take your leadership, communication, and people skills to the next level and become the kind of leader people want to follow. And now, your host and leadership development strategist, Haleli Azulai. Hey, hey, welcome back to the Talent Grow Show. This is episode 22. I'm Haleli Azulai, your leadership development strategist, and my guest is Chip Joyce. Chip is the CEO and co-founder of a company called Allied Talent that he has co-founded with Reid Hoffman, the CEO of LinkedIn, and a couple of other authors that you've probably heard of. And he's probably working on transforming, revolutionizing the world of work. But we also talk about how he created this opportunity for himself, because I don't think that many people go about a job search the way that Chip did to find this opportunity, to craft this opportunity. And I think that you're going to learn a lot from it. I can't wait for you to hear it. Also, there's, of course, the actionable tip at the end. And Chip even offers us a downloadable worksheet that I will make available on the show notes page that can help you take that action. So here we go. Chip Joyce, episode 22, The Talent Grow Show. We're here with Chip Joyce. And I'm really excited about this interview because Chip is a friend of mine, but also someone I have admired and followed his career. He is the CEO and co-founder of Allied Talent, a consulting and training company that works with organizations that want to learn and adapt the alliance management framework, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, in order to recruit, manage, and retain entrepreneurial employees, those team members who make companies adaptive and innovative. Chip, welcome to the Talent Grow Show. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure. And before we get into the opportunity for you to talk more about what you do with Ally Talent and your career, I want to get a little bit of an overview. I always do this at the beginning of every interview of your journey. And it's hard to do in a short amount of time, but I think it's very informative about who you are and where you've been. So how did you get to where you are today? <laughs> You know, my career has really been entrepreneurial and that I've always been drawn to solving big problems and I've done it in a few industries. Uh, For a while, I was in banking and finance, briefly in media, and for the past several years, I've really been focusing on how can we make work be more fulfilling. Mm. And what kind of roles have you had then? I mean, if you can talk about maybe like the kinds of hats you've worn. A lot. Um, I started out... Um, as an analyst in a bank, first corporate job, pretty much hated it. Uh, I was a product manager for technology for a little bit in a banking-related field. And I started my own company after that, uh, which was this intersection of finance and internet technology at the time. It was really hot, and I knew something, and most people knew nothing. So I had a company uh, around that for a while. Um, I actually had a high-end women's fashion company as a side project oh in a graphics gosh. design studio. And I was not the creative side. I was sort of the business side of those. And then I went to work again as a consultant for companies in banking, finance, and then the media for a while. And eventually I started working in boutique consulting for banks and hedge funds. And I was a managing director of two companies doing that. One was in New York and one was in London. And it was very global experience, traveled around the world for that job or for those jobs for a few years. And then I worked for a private equity division of an investment company. And that ended abruptly in 2008 mm. with the market crash. And at that point, I just decided, what, I, what do I really want to do? The financial field is pretty boring and broken. And I was interested at that time in how, really how to make work better. And I worked for David Allen Company for five years. I'd gotten to know him and the team there. So that was really helping people to be more engaged at work and tips to be more productive and things like that. So I I started working on sort of large cultural interventions in corporations. And, you know, that sort of 
really strengthened this obsession of mine where I just saw people coming to work every day and not really being fulfilled mm. and frustrated about it. And that was a tiny piece of a much larger picture. Yeah, well, I see that too. My gosh. And so I think we're on a similar mission to, I love yeah. that, to make work better. So before we get into a little more of how you currently work, and thank you for that. That was interesting because I, I wanted the listeners who don't know you as I do to see and hear how many different ways you've done work and the kind of roles that you've had because they've informed the value that you bring to your current endeavors. So before we do talk about uh, your company, Allied Talent, I found very interesting through just sort of how you've shared your journey along the way with me and others who are friends with you about how you created this opportunity for yourself. Because I do, I meet a lot of people who feel unfulfilled or who feel like their work is not exactly allowing them to use their strengths or, you know, they sort of feel stuck. And especially if they get into a job search mode. And rarely is like the perfect job just printed in some or written in some job bank somewhere. And you crafted this. So can you maybe talk a little more about once you ended the your previous role and you weren't sure what to do next, how do you think you did your job search differently from what most people do or how they go about it? And what's the biggest lesson that you learned from this experience? Yes. So I agree with you completely that if someone's looking for a job, it can be an incredibly frustrating and depressing experience and really make people feel worthless because you know, job board applications and recruiters and things like that, if they aren't working for you, you just feel like nobody wants you, nobody yeah. values you. And I hear that from so many people. And the truth is, Almost nobody is seeing you as a person when you're going through job applications in that way. There are computer systems and filters and people, even if they see it, they don't even know that, you know, this some low level person who's looking for keywords. And so it's a terrible way to find a job. Mm-hmm. And I, I, in fact, I made it a point to never do that again. Uh, and I never did. Um, last time when I did leave my company, not having any idea what I was going to do next, I resolved I would never do that. And instead, what I did was I had an idea of what I was interested in. And I looked for companies who were doing things like that. And I wrote to CEOs, uh, mostly through LinkedIn. And I never asked for a job. I never said I was looking for a job. I just said, um, here's something that I think you're thinking about. Here's what I have to offer thoughts or whatever it is, I think we should have a conversation. That is so bold to write to CEOs. I mean, I I just don't really know very many people who would do that. Yeah. And, you know, maybe in in some time in the future, too many people will do it. But Mm. the number of people who actually responded positively, I would say was over 80 and 90 percent. Wow. And so I talked to a lot of people and that was the opposite of looking for jobs that, you know, don't come through or you don't get responses. Uh, They were all meaningful, rewarding experiences in and of themselves. I got to meet interesting people, find out what they were thinking. And, you know, many of those people, they're now part of my professional network. And from those conversations, just organically, some job opportunities came up. Uh, Not that I asked for them, but rather you know, the CEO would say, you have a lot to offer. Maybe there's something here that we should be doing. And I declined a couple of the opportunities. I actually got a friend of mine, a job that <laughs> came about through this. Wow. Um, and, and in the meantime, I was doing some consulting work and just to basically pay bills and whatever. And I was thinking maybe that's what I need to do is just continue to do what I was doing and make that my new career step. The, the, the consulting, you mean, or yeah, the talking to the uh, yeah, no, the consulting. <laughs> and um, the problem is, I really just like working alone, and that was the number one issue that I had with it. And so I still continue talking to people, trying to find something that I could do where I could work with people and collaborate. And I really just cared about that a lot. And then serendipitously, what happened was I made friends with a partner at McKinsey who'd been my client for years. And he sent me an article written by someone named Cal Newport, who's a a professor at Georgetown. Yeah, I love his writing. Yeah, and he's a best-selling author. And 
I was interested in the t- blog topic. And so I wrote to Cal and we ended up talking on the phone a few times. And he was interested to see if I could help him with some ideas that he had and projects. And the truth was, I didn't really have the expertise he needed. But then he emailed me and he said, you know, I've got some friends who are writing a book and they're looking at business ideas. Is there something that, you know, would you be willing to talk to them? Because I think you could help. And so I said, sure. You know, I'm talking to people. <laughs> That's what I do every day now. And it turned out to be my um, business partners, Ben Kasnoka and Chris Yeh. And they were writing a book with the founder of LinkedIn, who is a friend of theirs, Reid Hoffman. And that was the book, The Alliance. And they were trying to figure out if there was a way to build a business around it. And they'd talked to tons of people about different options. And so anyway, I started talking to them, telling them basically all the ideas that they've heard were no good. Hmm. And I was pretty critical of everything like that. And they kept wanting another call. So I felt like I was just shooting down ideas. I certainly wasn't looking for a job by doing that. (laughs) And then eventually I said, you know what? I'm going to write you a business plan um, that you can take. It's a gift. You can throw it away if you want. You can run with it. And so I did. I just went to Starbucks for a few hours and I wrote a really rough draft business plan and um, sent it to them. And they didn't call me back with the frequency that they used to. So I thought, well, I guess that stopped that conversation. I can get on with my life now. (laughs) And then after a while, they called me back and they said they've really been thinking about it and they want to discuss this. Um, If um, I'm interested, would I uh, join the, you know, would I start the company and run it? So that was pretty shocking to me because I really didn't think I was you know, there's any possibility there. At this point, I was just giving free advice. Uh, So I flew out to to meet them. We met at Greylock headquarters, the famous uh, venture capital firm. And I met uh, Ben and Chris and then Reed. And after a couple of days there, we decided to start Allied Talent. So it was pretty surprising the way that unfolded. That's pretty amazing. So what's the biggest lesson you would share with someone else about this experience, about the job search? You know, it's it's really about networking, professional networking, and getting over the cheesy thought of what networking means. So, you know, there's networking events where people hand their business cards out and try to pitch and all that stuff. It's really just being, hopefully each person is is curious, and inquisitive. And if you have that, ask questions, learn about things, talk to people, try to share anything that you know, be very generous, I think, with your time, uh, with people who matter. I mean, not with everybody, but, you know, people who have some value in their profession or in how you see them or whatever. Uh, And by giving them things, you know, it really reminds me of Adam Grant's give and take. Yes. That you know, this, it's the serendipity that occurs when you do it. And the more you do it, the higher chance you have of serendipity. Uh, so this story sounds like, you know, sort of a fairy tale, right? Yeah. And the reality is, though, that this is a product of behavior that I've been cultivating for a very long time. Mm. So, and I think that's the case in most people where it looks like they're just lucky. Yeah. You just don't see what actually has been going on for a very long time. Yes, I love that. I totally agree. It's funny because just yesterday, um, it won't be yesterday when this releases, but it was yesterday that it happened. I was talking to a group of students about networking and, you know, sharing. I, I, I hold a very similar philosophy. And, you know, when you, it's the mindset, if you have about networking and what its purpose is, that it changes the way you do it and it totally shifts the results. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I think that you are really, I mean, your story is exemplary and I, I think it's very, very inspiring to a lot of people. So thank you for sharing that. Well, I definitely want to talk more about your company because I am so excited. About, I, I mean, I, I love the work that, that your co-founders um, do and, and what they've written. And I think that what you're trying to do is to revolutionize the world of work through the way in which um, you're, you're suggesting employers change their relationship with employees. So 
you could probably talk about that for three days straight, but right. in a short amount of time, give us the, you know, maybe like really tall building elevator pitch. What does your company actually teach? Sure. So what we're trying to do is change this perspective of how employers and companies basically and the employees work together. Um, because right now everything's broken. Uh, mm -hmm. It's broken so fundamentally because there's no trust. And I think that's just the essential problem. Um, everybody who's employed knows there's pretty high likelihood you're not going to be employed by that company um, for very long. Mm -hmm. And um, whether it's by, you know, layoffs or the company goes out of business, which we've seen plenty over the past few years, or, you know, you're, the company just changes strategic direction and you're no longer wanted, or you just realize as an employee that, you know, you better move on because this isn't going to be the right place for you in a year or two. Uh, and so the reality is there's no conversations about this, of course, because the company pre pretends that you're going to be there forever. And the employee pretty much pretends that they're going to be there forever. Uh, you don't normally tell your boss, hey, I think I'm going to work here for two or three years and then go work for your competitor. Right. And so what really happens then on a, an interpersonal level is you have uh, nobody actually knowing what is truly what you want out of the relationship. So the manager doesn't know as an employee that you might be there in order to acquire certain types of skills. So you can make a career pivot. And that's, you know, a lot of people are doing that. And similarly, the manager, not knowing that uh, about the employee, doesn't know what the, would keep that employee really engaged. And so he might be assigning the wrong types of work or making assumptions about what the employee really wants. Assuming, let's say, that the employee wants a promotion to the next level and always thinking about work in terms of that way. Like what would be the next step for this person mm -hmm. to get that promotion internally? And the employee on the other hand has no interest in that job, but pretends that they do because they think that's the way that they're going to show that they're a team player and that they're loyal to the company. And then what happens is both parties are misaligned. They don't understand each other. They don't have any trust in each other. And they're missing a great opportunity because it might be that if they really understood each other, they could redefine the, that work relationship and what the employee is doing and understanding, hey, in two or three years, that employee wants to do something radically different. They would be in a much better position to do it if they achieved something meaningful in this company. And guess what? That's actually what the company needs. So what we really learned is, all right, that's a great framework, and we, we have structures to do that. We call it tours of duty, which is really a realistic time frame and a commitment a manager and employee make to each other to achieve a mission. And that mission completed is going to transform the company in a good way and the person's career. And that's what you're always striving for. But what we learned by working, we started working with LinkedIn and then been working with a bunch of companies since, is that none of this can work unless you build trust. And, and managers really have to work hard to earn trust of their employees. Yeah. Um, managers don't like to hear this. They think, well, I'm a good guy. Why wouldn't someone trust me? And it's because you're a manager, you have power, and you represent a company that really doesn't care about that employee when it comes down to it. You know, if there's a business need that employee is going to be unemployed the day before Christmas, who cares? And so, you know, you're in a position as a manager where you're really, you know, institutionally not a trustworthy person. And you've got to understand that and acknowledge it and then say, okay, well, all that may be true, but here's what I want to do for you. You and I, I want to have a professional alliance. I care about you. I want to help you out. And I, I want to have a meaningful understanding of what you want. And I really want to be there to help you to get that independently of the company, whatever. I mean, you work for me. We have goals here, but you and I are both not going to work here forever, most likely. And I would like to have a professional relationship with you that, you know, transcends this temporary time when I'm your boss. And so we teach managers how to have trust building conversations in a very specific way. 
um, and really to get to employees' aspirations and career goals and helping managers to figure out in the real constraints that they have of you know their bureaucracy, the limitations and budget and opportunities or whatever, ways for the employee to feel highly engaged at work as much as possible and to do something meaningful and help them get to the next step in the career, wherever that is, internally or somewhere else, totally different industry, whatever it is. And by working together like that with realistic timeframes, which we you know, call tours of duty, which can be, you know, for young employees, it might be a year and it could be three or four or five years. It's usually not longer. Um, let's just do something great together and achieve it and then reassess where we are. And maybe, you, you know, there's another tour of duty for you here. Maybe it's somewhere else. So anyway, we've been teaching managers on, in workshop format. And then we've learned that we really need to know more about companies. Uh, the culture as it's perceived by employees is very important. And the reality is most of senior executives, who are often the ones who bring us into a company, they actually don't know the truth of what their culture is yeah. in a company. That's scary, too. Yeah, they live in a bubble. Either yeah. they live in a bubble. Uh, a lot of companies we grow, we worked with uh, have been fast growing. So the culture when the company was twenty people or fifty people, in the mind of the CEO, it's the same. Mm. When it's five hundred people, and maybe for the senior team, the culture is the same. But what we find is when you go to them to the middle ranks of the organization, you know, the first level of management. Their perception of what the culture is is often totally at odds with what the CEO tells us it is. And one of the things is, you know, here at CEO, we have a very transparent culture, very high mm. trust, et cetera. And then you talk to people who, you know, first line managers and their employees or whatever, and they say, yeah, we don't really trust this organization. Uh, they laid off 30% of the people last year, broke people's hearts. We don't know where it's the company's going. We don't know the strategy. We're all worried. And if that's the climate in an organization, we can't actually be very successful unless we know that. Because mm -hmm. if the company has such problems like that, then trusting the manager doesn't really mean too much if you think the whole company is untrustworthy. Right. It's not an option. No. And so what we did, we made a very good decision. We hired uh, Marla Gottschalk, who um, has a PhD in industrial and organizational psychology. And she's really been focused on this idea of how to make work a better pl experience. And so together we've created a diagnostic for a company. And it's a 50, person, a 50 question survey that all employees take. And we've been able to really diagnose what's going on in an organization. And then we're better prepared as a consulting and training company to address the real issues. Mm -hmm. And we've actually built from workshops, now we have full, it's really just HR and organizational change consulting yeah. uh, that we've built into. And we can tell companies, this is what's working, this is what's not working, and if you don't fix it, we have pretty good indications to tell you what's going to happen in terms of um, high turnover, disengagement, lower productivity, et cetera. And here's what you need to do to change it. And a lot of it is just really back to how do you create the manager and employee relationship better? And how do you make the structure of the organization conducive to that relationship? So it changes job competencies. Uh, performance reviews, um, promotions, how you think about your career, uh, how you uh, have meetings, manager to employ, uh, development plans, things like that. All that really has to change. And, you know, we've started to find companies who are really willing to, you know, essentially redesign their entire company around this idea. Yeah. It's a little bit of a hard sell, isn't it? It's very hard, and it takes um, an amazing leader, frankly, to be willing to do this. Yeah. Um, so it, it's um, you know we're way ahead of our time in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good work still, but I can imagine what a challenge it is, and it almost sounds like you set out to change the world of work with this kind of 
one idea about, you know, creating more authenticity and transparency and bringing out this thing that's been cloaked in mystery for, for too many years and, and, and creating a different way of looking at work and talking about work. And now it's almost like you recognize that's premature if, you know, if the culture doesn't even allow it and if the trust isn't there. So it's almost like you can't even get to talking about the alliance until you talk about the bigger culture. Is that true? It's true. And in fact, you know, we've been in business now for two years. And what we're recognizing is uh, we, we need to also get better at meeting organizations where they are. Mm. So if they aren't prepared to make the fundamental changes, the radical changes um, yet, you know, in large corporations, it's hard to change anything that we're now thinking of how can we make incremental positive changes um, that moves them in the direction, but it's not um, as controversial and radical um, as what our ideal is. Mm. And, and we have really good ideas on how to do that. Um, and they're not controversial. It's, I mean, you know, how do we have better career development in our organization, that's not controversial. Yeah. Nobody seems to know how to do it. Yeah. Um, everybody's talking about it. So we have some, we have ideas. We can help to do that. Yeah. Um, and it's always in the spirit of the Alliance framework, if not in its full uh, implementation. Got it. Got it. So, wow. Well, cool. I, I thank you for sharing that. It's, I think that it helps uh, reinforce uh, you know, the, the idea that ev all of work, all of everything we do, no matter what our role is, is, is iterative and, um, and it's sort of like a process or a journey. You know, you, you don't like flip the switch and, and, and make some kind of change. It's always this incremental journey. Um, and so it's like you've recognized along the way some of the barriers and then you went to attack them, you know, and, and you're, and you're building towards that outcome that you can, envision but there is there is work that's along the way that's shifted the way your company works along with it that all organizations should really do that you know adapt to the signs uh that are there and and to what's needed in in the moment yeah and you know i'm fortunate because my partners are very aligned because this is very tech and silicon valley orientation it's like Google's permanent data. Yeah. And we have that in our company. And it's hard for some people to get used to. Uh, some people that we've brought on, it takes time for them to get used to it, that uh, we we roll things out um, when they're half-baked. Mm -hmm. And we try them, and we're constantly, constantly changing things. Um, just as an example... Um, every single workshop that I've run, uh, three or four hours, I would imagine that there's probably 10 hours of debriefing and redesigning of the workshop every single time we do it. Wow. And it's never the same. And now there's a downside to that. Yeah. Because the downside is you're always reintroducing grammatical errors and typos and pagination and little things like that never get perfected. Because, you know, you're changing something significantly. And so it's like just rapid development of something. Yeah. Um, and I would rather do that because our product gets better all the time in the essence. Um, and the cost is, uh, to some extent, looking a bit amateurish mm. because we haven't, you know, I'm never going to hire a graphics art artist and create permanent books yes. with every single page perfect yeah. because if I do that the next time I run a workshop I'm never going to feel that freedom yes. of reinventing it because I now I have an enormous investment on this static thing oh. and so it drives some people nuts and frankly I've had some clients in learning and development who think you know, poorly of us as being kind of amateurish mm. okay. and they don't get it. They don't get that. They're getting literally the most cutting edge thought that we had. Yeah. That we didn't have a week ago. Yeah. Oh, and you illustrate a, a dichotomy really well. I think of, of, you know, said that is true in so many other areas, you know, that you, the more that you commit a way, even a way of thinking, 
the more you become resistant to changing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. Oh, I'd love to talk to you forever about it, but we're we're pretty much um, coming close to the end of our time with this podcast, and maybe we can do a sort of a, a, a session B another time. So um, I want you to, oh, I always have my guests share one specific action that they can recommend people take this week to upgrade their leadership skills. But before we get to that, what's um, a very short description of something that's new and exciting, a new project, a new discovery that has your attention? Well, coincidentally, today we launched um, another beta. Uh, it's a project called Culture Sprout. And you call it culturesprout.com. You can go there. And um, what we're really doing now is we have a new diagnostic tool that's up there, and we're asking people to take this survey. It takes a few minutes. And it's for us to collect information on how people perceive their current employer's career development opportunities. And this data is going to inform us. Basically, what we're doing is creating a new service, which is going to help employees articulate their needs for employee development and also get a sense of, you know, ultimately finding out what companies are better at offering employee development than others and help companies better understand the needs of their employees and also rank themselves against other companies. So it's really to help solve this problem of why does everybody complain about lack of career development and why can't companies figure out how to serve it? And so we're going to try to provide really objective information that's going to help everybody win. So, so culturesprout.com. Okay, please. good. I'll put Go that in the show notes. Survey. Thank you. And so it's a free survey? Yes. Excellent. Well, I think that sounds like amazing data to have and certainly near and dear to my heart and the work that I do yes. helping uh, create development opportunities for, for people in organizations. And um, it should provide amazing data also to, to leaders to help them figure out what what else they could do or or what might be getting in their way thank you for that and i would love to talk to you more about it once you have some more data in maybe mm -hmm. we can bring sure. that into our next talk about all the stuff that you have to share so chip what do you recommend people do one specific action that people can take that's not too hard to do this week even today that's going to make them a better leader well i think the first thing you should do is choose it, one employee that you have uh, who has your most attention it could be your star. It could be the one you're concerned about leave, disengaged or might leave. And you have to have a very different kind of conversation. Um, you really need to learn how to get to their true aspirations, their career goals, and don't ask them that question because you will not get an answer. Hmm. Instead, what you really need to do is tell them what your career goals are and aspirations and discuss things and open up and tell them things that you wish they would tell you. And by leading that and being vulnerable, you can kickstart a conversation. And then you can say, after you do that, you know, I'd really like to meet again. And this time, you know, if you would tell me your journey, you know, what's important to you, where you want to go, start by uh, sharing first. And in fact, if you want, I can make available to your listeners, um, a worksheet that we use to help get those conversations going? Yes, of course. Why not? Okay. Okay, cool. So how, how can people get that? Should they email you or do you want to give it to me for to create a download? Maybe? Yeah, I, I can make it available to you. Okay. Great. Okay, cool. So um, uh, folks listening, that's an amazing opportunity for you to actually take action on, on Chip's suggestion. And thank you for that, Chip, because I think that that will make it helpful. So what's the best way for people to learn more about you and stay in touch? LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. It's easy to connect with me there. At Chip Joyce on Twitter and Chip at Allied Talent is my email address. Very good. Well, I hope that everybody does because you, you're an interesting guy. You're a very thoughtful guy. And there's a lot to learn from what you put out in the world and also just from the way that you role model how, how you go about your career. Thank you for sharing your journey and your work with my listeners on the Talent Grow Show, Chip. I appreciate you. Oh, thank you. And best of luck to Talent Grow. Thank you. I appreciate it.
well, wasn't that inspiring? And are you going to take that action? That's a really important conversation. And let me tell you, if you're not currently a leader of others, you are a person who can have this conversation with the person who is your manager, your supervisor. And um, this is an important conversation. Now, of course, you can't make the other person reveal things to you or be vulnerable in front of you as you could yourself as the leader, for sure. And so I hope that this is something that you will put into your bag of tricks, even if you can't fully implement this right now. But go ahead and download the worksheet. It's on the show notes page. I will make it very easy for you to download it. And so go to talentgrow.com forward slash podcast forward slash episode 22. And you'll be able to see all of the different resources that we mentioned and ways to contact Chip to take that survey and to download that worksheet. Thanks for tuning in to the Talent Grow Show. I appreciate you, and I really want to hear from you about the shows that you would like to hear next. What are the topics? Who are the guests? How would you like to get involved? So make sure to leave me a comment or email me, hilali at talentgrow.com, because I'm here for you, and it has to work for you for it to work for me. So I can't wait to hear from you. In the meantime, as always, make today great. Thanks for listening to The Talent Grow Show, where we help you develop your talent to become the kind of leader that people want to follow. For more information, visit talentgrow.com.